Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us here this wonderful afternoon here at Beloit College, Beloit's College. I love the history of Beloit. I love reading about it. I love hearing it from the people who know it far better than I do, many of the people in this room. I love putting its present and future in the context of its past. I love it, in fact, so much that I recently spent an afternoon head down over the Kelsu survey of the city, a survey prepared in 1837. It was a survey done in the town's embryonic stage just over a year after the arrival of Caleb Blodgett, who purchased the land that was to become Beloit, after a brief and apparently unhappy flirtation with the name New Albany. This survey was done when the city's families could be counted on one hand, and it arrived even before the first settler's child was born, which was, if you're interested, 176 years and one week ago on the 29th of March, 1838. It was an early undertaking, yet to my surprise and delight, this survey includes a map of the town that should be, in at least one case, a town that would be, a town with a college street, 1837 right there behind you, nine years before there would be anything like a college here, seven years before any group came to even think about a college street, there was a college street, or at least plans for a college street for a college of Beloit. I love the history of Beloit College and the history of the city of Beloit, both and as this example explains, I love both because you cannot, you cannot understand one without the other, unlike nearly any other college town that I know, our histories intersect and intertwine and mesh together. They are histories that intermingle very much like the tree canopy that very shortly will again emerge and shade our community and college, a canopy that from the air nearly makes the college and the city indistinguishable. It is only appropriate and right that the city and the college share a name inseparable. And while the connections are ubiquitous, there are a few intersections worthy of, there are a few intersections worthy of a big exclamation point. Today we honor one such intersection. Today we honor Roy Chapman Andrews, native to the city of Beloit and a graduate of the College of Beloit. He is a distinguished product of both, and we share in our appreciation of his extraordinary contributions to our understanding of our world, contributions that continue to be important scientifically, widely recognized, and wonderfully inspirational. At this school, we take enormous pride in offering an education that is fundamentally tethered to the liberal arts principles of learning broadly while thinking deeply. And likewise, an education that we expect our students and graduates to put into practice daily in their professional and personal lives. The liberal arts in practice is a philosophy we embrace and it is a philosophy that is personified throughout Roy Chapman Andrews' remarkable life, his life of purposeful consequence that was itself born, developed, and nurtured through his youth in Beloit City and College. On behalf of Beloit College, it is therefore an honor to host this year's Roy Chapman Andrews Society's Distinguished Explorer Award presentation and lecture, and our honored guest, Dr. Lauman. That canopy reference earlier, by the way, was for you. I am very grateful, the members of this society, to continue, continue to keep in front of us this glorious part of the city and college's history. It is my honor to give up the podium to the president 
of the Roy Chapman Andrews Society, Carla Swain, who will offer you further introductions. Carla. Welcome to the Annual Society Distinguished Explorer Award presentation event with our honored recipient of the award. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our board members of the Society, William Green, Debbie Heisinga, Monica Christopa, Martha Mitchell, Joe Stottleman, Steve Varvis, Lyman Elliott, Ken Forbeck, Lynette Newton, Don Reed, Kevin Brown, Andrew Yonke, and Tom Warren, past board members Carol Elliott, Jerry White, Sherry Strom, and Rick Dexter, members of the Society, Ruth Carlson, our administrative assistant, and Ann Bossom for her continued support. Please give them a big hand. <laughs> we would like to recognize all of our sponsors that support the Society and the Distinguished Explorer Award. Those are ABC Supply, Alliant Energy Foundation, Beloit College, Black Hawk Bank, Co-America Bank, First National Bank and Trust, Resonate Web Marketing, River's Edge Foundry, the Rotary Club of Beloit, the School District of Beloit, the State Line Community Foundation, and Visit Beloit. Without these supporters, we could not go on financially to support and bring you this award. Thank you. The Society is pleased to offer these awards, including the morning program for area youth at Beloit Memorial High School, to promote appreciation of Beloit's hometown hero, Roy Chapman Andrews, and to promote scientific exploration of the sort Andrews pioneered. And now, I would like to introduce Ann Blossom, one of the founding members of the Society and Andrews biographer. Thank you, Carla, and thank you all for being here. For once, we didn't have to have a weather adventure. And uh, hope, hopefully you'll like the fact that we decided it was time to have this event in spring for a change. Well, I wish I could stand here this afternoon and say with great authority as I explore the connections between our award's namesake and today's honored guest that, of course, Roy Chapman Andrews climbed trees during his childhood in Rock County, Wisconsin. But truthfully, we have no idea whether he did or not. Andrews left behind no documentation of trees ascended during his youth, but surely he did climb trees. Did you? I, I did. How, how many of you climbed trees at one time or another? Absolutely. And I think we can safely assume that the intrepid Andrews did too. Perhaps he sought the prize of a bird's nest lodged overhead in a maple, or maybe he anchored himself amongst the branches of a sturdy oak so that he could observe the fauna in action below. Perhaps he scaled a particularly lofty pine just because, like Everest, it was there. Surely he climbed trees. People often mistakenly assume that Andrews went on from his youthful explorations in Beloit to become trained as a paleontologist. After all, he led the 1920s series of interdisciplinary expeditions to the Gobi of Mongolia, where scientists found the first nests of dinosaur eggs, new species of dinosaurs, and the first evidence of the coexistence of dinosaurs and mammals. Those discoveries were possible because Andrews had had the creativity to put existing technologies to new uses, specifically by combining motorized transport in the desert with camel supply caravans. Furthermore, he had constructed a scientific team with representatives from many fields of study, paleontology, geology, zoology, and so on. Andrews represented the field of zoology, having earned, earned his master's in this discipline from Columbia University by writing a thesis about the California gray whale. He'd gone on to establish his reputation for discoveries made not just at sea, but by roaming the continent of Asia, trekking through parts of Korea, China, Tibet, and Burma, or as we call it now, Myanmar. To be a naturalist at the turn of the last century meant that you were good with a gun. Andrews had perfected his skills as a marksman during his youth in southern Wisconsin. 
I suppose we must consider that he might even have climbed trees in order to take better aim at targeted animals. Always interested in nature, Andrews had taught himself taxidermy so that he could create his own natural history museum, reportedly setting it up in the loft of the carriage house and stable behind his family home at 419 St. Lawrence Avenue. Those skills as a taxidermist helped him earn the money for his education at Beloit College. And when combined with his enthusiasm for natural exploration, the skills he'd honed during childhood proved useful after he talked his way into his first job at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. What would Andrews have made of today's field biologists? If naturalists carry weapons these days, chances are they're loaded with tranquilizers, not bullets. Museums still display the mounted remains of exotic creatures, but biologists measure their merit today not by the bag count of their marksmanship, but by their persistence of observation and discovery in the field. What would Andrews have thought? He would have loved it. Always at home in the out of doors, he would happily have befriended today's honoree, ascended with her to a fresh frontier in the treetop canopy, and begun to explore a new world. How wonderful that with his memory in mind, we can do just that thanks to today's event. Now I would like to introduce Yaffa Grossman, professor and chair of biology at Beloit College, who will tell you more about our honored guest. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Anne, for the introduction to Roy Chapman Andrews. I have the privilege and the pleasure of introducing this year's Roy Chapman Andrews Distinguished Distinguished Explorer Awardee, try saying that one quickly, and telling you a bit about her many accomplishments as a field biologist, a canopy explorer, an author, and a champion of forest canopies. Dr. Meg Lauman did her undergraduate work at Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts, where she majored in biology and minored in geology. She started, her early, res she started early on her forest research by writing her honors thesis about the timing and life cycle events and growth of 16 species of northern hardwood trees at Hopkins Memorial Forest at Williams College. Uh, she continued her, I guess I should add the aside that, that Meg knows, um, I did research at that same forest a year later after she graduated with her advisor. I didn't figure that out until last week, but <laughs> uh, she continued her forest studies at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, where she earned a Master's of Science in Ecology by studying the growth of birch trees, and then she traveled to Sydney University in Australia for her PhD studies, where she researched leaf growth and herbivory in Australian rainforest canopies. Can you detect a theme? Trees? Tops of trees? After holding a variety of faculty positions, Dr. Lauman served as the Director of Research and Conservation and then Chief Executive Officer at Selby Botanical Gardens in Florida, the Director of Environmental Initiatives and Professor of Biology and Environmental Studies in, in a Science Outreach Partnership between the New College of Florida and Sarasota County Regional Government, and the Director of, Nature, of the Nature Research Center at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And this year, she moved across the country to San Francisco and started a new position as the Chief, Science, Chief of Science and Sustainability at the California Academy of Sciences. She has authored numerous scholarly papers on forest canopies and edited books on the structure and function of forest canopies and how to conduct research well above the ground. She's written two books on her experiences as a woman who does field biological research, and she's engaged in a wide variety of citizen science activities that help people learn about forests and about ecology, often by engaging them in data collection and analysis that contribute to both to our basic scientific knowledge and the development of conservation policy. I'm certain that Dr. Lauman will tell you about her research and adventures in tree canopies. I'll get you ready with a few pieces of information about forests. One, forests house the majority of terrestrial plants and animals on Earth. Researchers have estimated that 30 million species of plants, animals, fungi, proteas, and bacteria live in forested ecosystems. Two, forests provide a variety of ecosystem services that include capture, capturing and storing carbon through photosynthesis, releasing oxygen through that same process, providing lumber, fuel, food that are used by many people of many cultures, limiting soil erosion, and protecting water quality, to name just a few of the functions that they perform. 
Because forest canopies are difficult to reach, we know less about them than we know about other ecosystems. As a leader in forest canopy exploration, Dr. Lauman has expanded our knowledge of this important ecosystem. And because of her leadership, the Roy Chapman Andrews Society has chosen her as the 2014 recipient of its Distinguished Explorer Award. It's now time for the presentation of that award by Carla Swain, president of the society, Ann Bossom, and Dr. Bierman. Would you all please come forward along with Dr. Lauman? I'm here to read the citation that will be presented to Dr. Lauman, or at least a copy of it. Here's the real deal. <laughs> Margaret Canopy Meg Lauman, biologist, explorer, arbornaut, author, parent, conservationist. When seven continents proved insufficient to satisfy your curiosity, you, simply, you discovered another simply by looking skyward. Instead of following your gaze beyond the reach of gravity into the heavens, you chose to test the boundaries of Earth's pull by becoming the mother of canopy research, cradled in the rustling arms of forests from the Americas to Africa to Australia, defying boundaries that separated women from science and professional life from family responsibilities, you built bridges between those worlds, setting a path for other parents and women to follow. By adding your sons to your research team, you imported the curiosity and creativity of children to a place where trees rule and everyone becomes both student and teacher. When confronted with unreachable frontiers, you, in the tradition of the awards namesake, innovated with ropes, walkways, construction equipment, and the elemental forces of hot air until the canopy cloud came into view as never before. Not satisfied with merely studying at new heights, you have employed your passions to assure that the health of these ecosystems and the wealth of our planet can grow stronger through your outreach and advocacy. In appreciation for these contributions, we are pleased to bestow on you the honor of distinguished explorer from the Roy Chapman Andrews Society this 11th day of April, 2014, in Beloit, Wisconsin. My goodness, I'm humbled and honored, and I'd like to know what kind of timber this is later. <laughs> it's a beautiful piece. <laughs> this is really a joy and an honor to follow in the footsteps of such an amazing museum, explorer, adventurer, and scientist. So thank all of you, and I hope for those of you that are under the age of 80 that you might join me in an expedition, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, Anne was so good to ask my first question because this morning I asked a thousand kids, have you ever climbed a tree? And all of them raised their hand. And then I said, is anyone scared of climbing a tree? And two raised hands. So that was very honest, I thought. Um, and I too have a high respect for heights and we all should. So there are lots of ways we can get into trees safely. So with this presentation, I hope to take you around the world kind of quickly to experience some canopies. We have a little tiny bit of a washed out projector, so pretend we're in a dust storm in the rainforest. It'll be great. And um, away we go from my new place, California Academy of Sciences, on to what is now the world's canopies and my favorite, favorite method. And there are three things I hope you'll go home with today. And one is that, um, you need to have passion in your career. If you're a student, I would say go with what you love. It's obvious that um, I loved trees all my life. And I would also say that as a scientist, I spent a lot of time inventing things. Maybe 50% of what I do has been to adapt and innovate new tools for my research, which is not anything I ever expected to do. 
And the third take home message is that I think in the world of conservation biology now we need to seek solutions. More than finding out what's wrong with the forest or why things are degrading, we need to figure out how to fix it and move on. So that's really what this lecture is all about. You can go home if you want to. Three lessons. Um, so here I am in the canopies of Cameroon, Africa, my absolute favorite place. This is where I took Mark Moffat as a photographer, by the way, and his camera goofed up. So we found a new ant and he photographed it, but we never got the picture. So we have to go back. Maybe some of you can join us someday. Um, Okay, so these are not my children, but they well could be, and they could be some of you when you were young. I think underlying exploration today is this amazing revolution in science, and here is how a lot of us learned about nature. We touched it, we went to the beach, and we experienced it, and that's certainly what happened to me. I grew up in a very small town, no movie theater, no internet, heaven forbid, and Yet today, this is how my kids go to the beach, you know? They have their iPhone and they talk to each other five feet away by texting. And so it's a whole different world and they see things on the beach or they maybe see things in the forest and they have an app that helps them identify it. So I call this the virtual versus real nature revolution. And we're all part of that. We could say to our kids, you know what? Drop the phone get rid of the computer and go out and hug a tree, but I don't think that really is going to work. So as parents and as scientists, I think we have to engage all of this generation in how to use those tools. And with that in mind, it really makes me try to think creatively about how we can create great forest conservation biologists in the next generation. Because quite honestly, as this picture says, you know, forests are worth a lot more alive than dead, but it's taken my generation a long time to figure out ways that we can study forests that have a positive outcome, not just all that gloom and doom that seems to come from too many scientists too often these days. Um, this is my childhood forest. I think it looks a lot like the forest around Beloit. I grew up in a smaller town than this, a more economically depressed town than this called Elmira, New York. Anybody ever heard of that? And technically, Lauman, New York is outside of Elmira, New York. It's where the train used to stop on Route 17, but now there's only a sex shop there, so I'm really sad that most of my ancestors have moved away. There's a few herds of cattle, but this was my home forest of childhood. And here is, of course, the ancestral botany uh, going through my family, but that's what they used to do with the cornfields. And, the turn of the century, and there's only one bottle left of Lauman whiskey, and nobody dares to try it. But one of these days, maybe I'll make a botanical experiment out of it. First gender description, but I liked nature, and nobody else really thought that was very cool in my day. So. There I am with my little wildflower collection. I'm even more embarrassed to admit that I used to make my parents stop the car. tree forts was my only one friend in the world that tolerated my nature and this is not our tree fort I googled tree fort you can do it tonight this one comes up in Hollywood it's so cool I want someone to invite me to visit it someday but I never had a camera as a kid so I just pulled this
Go figure. He was such a nerd that he used to sew clothing. And you know, at a pretty rough high school, if you're a boy in the 1960s sewing bell-bottom jeans, that was very not cool. And yet Tommy really followed his passion and look what happened to him. If only I had gone into clothing design, maybe I could save all the forests. <laughs> but the good news is he's working with me on some projects in Africa that I'll talk to you about later. So passion, passion, I just say that for all of the students in the room and even all the young adults, at some place in time, if we follow our hearts and our dreams, maybe it really makes us a little more successful or at least happy at the end of the day with what we're doing. So here's my passion. This is my toolkit for work. I made a slingshot when I was in graduate school by welding it in the shop at the University of Sydney. I um, got a harness that I sewed with some seatbelt webbing and I learned to climb with some cavers that went down the rope and they thought I was really weird because I went up the rope. But the cool thing is that I actually was able to go up these trees in Australia and nobody had ever done this. Everybody had been looking at forests from the ground. So it's kind of like a tunnel. When you think about a 200 foot high tree, it's really hard to see what is at the top of the tree. Oh, there's Bob Ballard. He and I did a big distance learning program together in the canopy. Bob's really scared of mosquitoes though. Oh my gosh, he couldn't wait to get back to his little air conditioned trailer every night. But I'm scared of undersea, so we were a good team. Um, in any case, by just getting a rope and a harness, and that cost me $50, I was able to go up a tree in Australia. Um, I'll never forget it. It was March 4th, 1979. It's my mom's birthday. She doesn't think that was really such a great gift. Um, because there I was at 125 feet in a coachwood tree, and everything around me was munching and eating and calling. And I suddenly realized that the quiet of the forest floor was not really the typical part of the forest. All of the action is at the top. And it's so extraordinary and overwhelming that, as was mentioned in my introduction, we now know that about half of the biodiversity on the land part of the planet is actually in the forest canopy. Everything from koala bears to millions and millions of insects to lots of plants and lots of reptiles and amphibians and of course many many things like this very very cool ant over in the bottom left so here's this extraordinary hot spot on the planet that no one had ever seen before and all of a sudden it opened so many doors to so much kind of research that this is a little map that just shows the dots of forests where i've worked because a really unexpected thing in my life was to suddenly find that I was going to different countries to study forests. And again, from a really small town, I never went anywhere until I got that scholarship to Sydney University, basically. And all of a sudden, now I'm working in Africa and Australia. And I point this out to kids because sometimes you don't know what turns your life will take. But just keep following your passions. Um, so now I love bugs. I never expected I would love bugs so much. I eat them. If you want some recipes, I can give them to you afterward. I think it's very sustainable, by the way, but I mostly discover them and figure out why they're important. And in doing that, it takes me inside of the bromeliad cups, amazing things in the canopy where thousands of things are living. It takes me to look at birds that are in the canopy eating the insects that I'm trying to identify. And it takes me looking at all sorts of endangered species like this Amazon parrot or this, one of the coolest things that I'm studying now, who knows what it is. What? I love that answer. Yes. Anyway, today I had to give a prize to a student who was the only person to know that cool creature. But I have a grant now for kids in wheelchairs to go into the canopy and do research because they can go up a tree without use of their legs. They can't walk across the forest floor. And in oak trees last summer in Kansas, we found four new species. And they're publishing them right now, of these cute little water bears. And they're not only cute, they do look like a bear, don't they? But they're little, little tiny things. And I promise you, they are the commonest organism in your canopies out here. But you probably just never knew what you were growing in your very own backyard. And I also tell my students that no one's a vegetarian because there's hundreds of them in every drop of water and your lettuce and your broccoli and everything you eat. So sorry about that. Um, <laughs> anyway, 
So we have this amazing world now up in the canopy. And you know, we went to the moon before we went into the forest canopy. It wasn't until 1979 I mentioned climbing that tree and my counterpart, a guy named Don Perry in Costa Rica, was climbing a tree the same year. We didn't know each other for five more years and we ended up finally meeting and saying, holy cow, there's all this cool stuff in the forest canopy and then the Smithsonian went into the canopies of Panama and suddenly started counting all these insects. So we have this amazing history of a very young science, which is discovering this eighth continent on the planet that started with ropes and harnesses and moved on to a couple other really dangerous things. I promise you, do not do this at home alone, but ladders look easy because they're really cheap. But when you climb up a ladder in a tall tree, if you see the beetle, and you reach for it, you know what happens, you let go of the ladder. So just this is the one thing that doesn't have a safety attached to it. So I always say to people, stick with the ropes and the harnesses, but try to avoid the ladders if you possibly can. But still a pretty cool thing to do if you're really brave. Um, the frustration for me using these ropes and harnesses was that one person, one rope, right? You can't put 20 people on a rope, why not? Oh, it will break, brilliant. Whoever you are back there, you need to come with me to the Amazon. Um, anyway, so in 1985, classic on the back of a napkin in Australia while I was working at an ecotourism lodge, we designed this aerial pathway, we called it, in Queensland, and we built the first one in 1985. A similar story, another colleague that I didn't yet know was building one in Indonesia. So that was the year where we kind of birthed this new technique called canopy walkways, which allowed a whole class of students or maybe someone who wanted to go up in the middle of the night and it's a little scary to go on a rope, or maybe someone who wants to work in the rain to see where the insects are hiding and you can't really use your ropes in the rain. So this technique was fantastic because it allowed us to have a lot more leeway. And so now I'm happy to say um, I have a little construction company where I take engineers and we build these in different countries, mostly in developing countries, because if villagers can make money from ecotourism, they might be less likely to log their forest. And so there's a big effort here to try to help people understand that this is a long-term solution to conservation. Cutting logs to get money for your family is a very short-term solution to your economic woes. Um, Back to the toolkit, though, we have ropes and harnesses now, we have canopy walkways, we have ladders. This is a construction crane, and if you have a million dollars in your budget, which very few forest biologists do, I'm sad to say that I wished I'd been an astronaut, because then you get billions of dollars in your budget, but I'm really an arbornaut, and we get hundreds of dollars in our budget. So we have to be a little more creative in our resources, but there are about 10 of these cranes around the world and they're very cool because you can get in the bucket and you can visit all the leaves or lizards or whatever you wanna study only within reach of the arm of the crane though. So this is a very good intensive tool if you wanna do research in one area only. Um, and finally, the sort of Jaguar or the Rolls Royce of my field is the hot air balloon, totally cool, which I showed you in the beginning. And this has this wonderful sort of base camp raft that's going to settle on this tree as well as the actual hot air balloon. So you have different inflatable devices that can allow you to look at the canopy, see the very tippy top leaves, which you cannot get to with a rope and usually not with a walkway either because you have to position it where there are sturdy branches. So this is a really awesome tool for the very tops of the trees. But again, it's about a million dollars to take an expedition. So you need a group of scientists or a really good backer that wants to fund your research for this kind of endeavor. Um, and woe is me, my only depressing slide, I promise you, but here is really what's happening to the forest. So much of our great efforts in the last 30 years, scientists working from National Science Foundation, from NOAA, from all kinds of global institutions, World Bank. We work and we work and we work and more forest is being destroyed than ever before. So there's not so much success. And my next half of this presentation is going to be 
trying to think outside of the box and say to you, what if, what if scientists could work a little differently? What if we gave tenure and promotions to people that actually made sustainable advances in their research rather than conventional publications? And I want to try to take you to a couple of those projects so you can see for yourself. Um, here's Hurricane Andrew. That was a week after I moved to Florida. I better be careful. I hope Beloit's safe next week. Um, but anyway, you know, we now know that the health of forests is related to so many environmental issues, climate change being one of them. And so we need to look after these forests. What happens in the Amazon really affects you guys. What happens in Africa with deforestation really affects the east coast of the US. And we know now what happens here as far as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is really affecting the crop harvest over in Ethiopia. So solutions, sustainability really needs to be the new way of educating students and conducting science. And I'm so happy that Beloit College is already doing that, which is really great. Um, OK, so this title of the slide that you can't see in the little dust storm is Saving Forests One Book at a Time. One thing I did that all my peers, who were mostly male, I might add, sorry guys, um, said, what? You're writing a book for the public? You should be writing a technical paper so you get a promotion and you get tenure quicker. And lo and behold, I wrote a book for Yale University because they asked me to. And they said, no woman has ever written a book about the tropics. This was 1994. And I kept wondering, gee, I have no female colleagues. You know, wonder why. And maybe part of it was because the voice was missing. So I wrote this book about my research projects. And I soon found out that everything I had done in terms of research was based a little on how old my kids were. Could they count beetles? Yes or no. Could they climb a tree? Could they, were they responsible enough to measure a leaf area? So every piece of my research was kind of related to how I was parenting. And so I ended up putting them in the book. And lo and behold, it got a cover review in the New York Times book review because the reviewer said, you know, I really wanted to find out if your kids fell out of the tree or not. She didn't care about the rainforest, but by reading the book, she learned a lot about the rainforest. So it taught me that in life, maybe as a scientist, I need to work more with public message, with media to make things work. Um, here's a really sad quote from Jay Leno. According to a study by the National Science Foundation, 70% of Americans do not understand science. Here's the sad part. 30% don't even know what 70% means. And maybe some of you remember when he said that on his program. But so we have a little issue here. And so we do need to think, I think, as scientists, not just about educating our own colleagues, but how is it we're going to reach the politicians? How is it we're going to reach religious leaders, all sorts of diverse stakeholders in this game? And for me, by default, because I was a single mom, my kids became kind of an avenue of reaching a lot of housewives, reaching a lot of moms, doing all sorts of things with schools and young people. And so here are my best research assistants. And I actually dedicated one of my books to them for that reason. Most people thank everyone in their lab or thank the person that edited their book. But in my case, I was pretty lucky that my boys actually came with mom. And they behaved mostly, not always. but. Um, for the most part, it was a pretty big joke in my lab. They always said, do you think Canopy Meg's going to leave her kids at the bottom of the tree with all the poisonous snakes or let them climb and risk their lives? So anyway, here they are at age four and five, climbing instead of being with the poisonous snakes. And so we had kind of this amazing adventure together as a little family. And they were always out in the field with mom. And we were always trying very hard to do different things. Here's James. Oh, he was so angry because he missed his first New Year's Eve party in middle school. But he got to learn how to work the blowgun by the village chief. So, you know, <laughs> he went back to school and he was so cool. So sometimes you have a win. There he is, about to have the blowgun lesson. But anyway, so trade-offs in both cases. My kids were a huge part of my research. And in the end, I think that really helped inspire my own sense of wonder, looking at things a little differently, probably asking questions a little differently. And so we ended up writing a book together as our second public book, in this case, with them as co-authors. And actually, their journal entries are at the end of every chapter about mom's research. And I kind of laugh, because their writing is so much more interesting than mine. And 
they wrote about things like they go, gee, our mom is the weirdest mom we know. She talks about insect poop at the dinner table. <laughs> so I never realized how it looked to be the kid of a scientist. So it was really good for me too to read their journals. So we did these things and you know, mostly because it was a family activity, but hopefully because it also would imprint my students who will grow up to be the next generation of scientists and maybe make that issue of juggling career and family a little bit more tolerable. And oh, here's the day that it rained 13 times. I cut their shoes off, but they, we had mud, like just hunks of mud all over our shoes in Belize, but they thought that was a blast. I thought it was horrible, but then I started to laugh because they thought it was so much fun. So once in a while, your kids really do help you get through a tight spot. Once in a while. Um, okay, so having children in science, I think, was a really extraordinary experience for me and definitely one that changed my life. Um, I want to talk a little bit quickly about India, where I've been working a lot. And the title here says, Saving India's Forest One Woman at a Time. This is a country where there are brilliant, brilliant women. And as we all know, 51% of the world is women. There are huge conservation issues or opportunities, depending on how you call it. India has 20% of its forests left, mostly locked up, because they don't know how to let 1.1 billion people use such a precious resource. But in these forests are tigers, which are being hunted, are other kinds of endangered species, which are worth thousands of dollars on markets in Africa and China and even the US. So not surprisingly, this relatively poor population is sneaking into the forest and hunting all these animals. But meanwhile, India has this extraordinary generation of young women who are wearing saris, having arranged marriages in many cases, really wanting to pursue careers in science, but they have no role models, no opportunities, and a lot of them end up in their rural villages doing exactly what their mothers did, which is collecting the breakfast, walking to get the water and having a very uh, menial lifestyle without any opportunity. So on a very limited scale, I've been working with some Indian colleagues and I was very fortunate to have Fulbright support to start going to India. And every trip I take now, I am mentoring women in science and we've been conducting workshops to teach these women to climb, which isn't easy with all of this amazingly beautiful silk drapery, but they're, they're so determined to have their own career. And so we're trying very hard, one at a time, to get enough women in positions where they can become the future leaders of Indian science. And they're so gifted and they're so bright that they deserve every single chance that you or I have, but they just haven't had an opportunity for that. And I take boxes of books over there and give them out. I think every chance we get that we can touch bright young people in different countries, we have so much better opportunity to make sure that resources are being used equitably, which really is what sustainability is all about. Um, walkways, I mentioned that before, another angle of canopy research that can be a great hook for conservation is building these walkways, as I mentioned before. Has anybody ever been on a canopy walkway? Ooh, some fun is in store, where? Costa Rica, there are lots down there now. It is a very big deal. I wish I had patented it, big mistake. Um, there's a great one in Florida. You don't have to travel too far if you're heading that way. There's another one in the Williams College campus, which was the first one I built in North America. But there are, there's a really couple cool ones in Australia, a few in Africa, but a lot in South America now. And these tools that we build for research can go a lot farther to save the forests than probably the data that we collect. And I just want to run through one special story in my heart, which was building a canopy walkway in Western Samoa. Anybody ever been on that one, the island of Savai'i? Anyway, you can put it on your bucket list because it's really beautiful. So here's what happened. I got a call from a colleague named Paul Cox who works on medicinal plants and he works in Western Samoa. He said, you've got to help me because I work on this island, we've just discovered a plant that might cure cancer, and now all of a sudden the village is being charged $53,000 
because they built a cement school. They love their children, they love education, so they wanted to build this school, but they owe money and they don't have any cash income. So he said, I have this idea that you could build them a walkway and they could raise the money through ecotourism. So we went and talked to the village chiefs. This is actually um, a tattoo. This is where tattoos originated, which fascinates me because in Samoa where tattoos originated, they're made of the dye of this one species of tree, which is very, very cool. And the reason I mention it is men get tattooed from their knees to their chest, but not all men. And so I asked one of the women, why do some have tattoos and some don't? And she said, well, in our culture, we believe that childbirth is the most painful experience in the world, but the second most painful one is getting a full body tattoo. So those guys make the best husbands. So now, when I have students with tattoos, I have to go, wow, you must be pretty cool for the girls. <laughs> it changed my mind about this tattoo thing, so be careful. Now, don't all rush out and get one after the talk. Um, so in Samoa, we met with the chiefs. We drank this native juice called kava, which kind of numbs all body parts. Um, they sat for seven hours cross-legged. They talked in Samoan, which we couldn't understand a word, but every once in a while they said, monkey woman, that was my English name, and they pointed at me and they all laughed. So we knew they were on task. And at the end, they decided they would take this huge risk and get us to build this walkway at the top of some giant fig trees in their forests. And the long story short, they now have this amazing little platform and walkway that goes out from the school, and in two years, they raised the money to pay back the debt for the school, so now all the money they bring in is going to give scholarships to some of their brighter and best students. So just a really great example, because in an island, if you cut all your trees down, there is never any way to bring that forest back. It is gone for good, because all of those seeds floated ashore, got brought by birds, a real long and almost random process would have created that unique forest. So once disappeared, an island forest can never be recreated. So these are really, really important places for conservation to occur. Um, another chapter of my research, in addition to walkways and um, writing books for the public that I found was really amazing, was a project back in that hot air balloon when I mentioned I was in Cameroon, Africa with Mark Moffat. Um, in this case, it was pretty cool because we went and did all this wonderful research on this amazing raft and balloon and everything, but here's the deal. We had 50 researchers, only one woman, I'm hesitating to say, but everyone went back to Japan, England, um, America, Canada, Brazil, and we all published our results. We discovered thousands of things. Everybody got promoted, they were happy, but one problem with that model, nobody in Cameroon benefited from our work. There weren't specimens left in a collection. The pygmies in the village that helped us carve out the little spot for our base camp didn't really benefit in too many ways because we probably harvested and destroyed a lot of the animals in their region. So how is it that we as scientists can start to work more effectively in some of these areas? And so the one thing that I thought to myself, well, maybe we could figure out a way again to use the canopy to create some income stream for all the people that are living in this area. So in this case, oh, just as an aside, there you can see me just there climbing up into that raft to spend the night to work on insects. Insects love feeding at night, so it's really great to have a little surface like that in the canopy at night. So that's how we use this raft. It's got um, mesh here and it's got these cute little Velcro things where you can put your hand through and grab a leaf or something fun that you might need to sample. So it's a brilliant little device. But in this case, um, oh, and one other amazing thing, because there were 50 people on this expedition, um, and this was 1991, I applied as M. Lauman, not as Meg Lauman. Now, why do you think I did that? So I got accepted. When I arrived at that base camp at 2 a.m., they were swearing in French like you cannot believe. Nobody wanted any women along, and there I was, they were stuck with me. So fortunately, we all became great friends, but they gave me this end hammock. There were 50 hammocks in a row, and they said, oh, you can have that one for more privacy when you get dressed, which was totally not true. 
But the real reason was this snake was living right there under my hammock. It's deadly poisonous. It's a Gabon viper. And I thought, oh, this is really sweet. Um, fortunately, it never bit me. Um, but I do have a good story about Mark Moffat. He had the hammock next to me, and I'll tell some of you later. And anyway, but here's our only colleague that was from Cameroon. And so he and I, a year later, said, you know what? How can we help? the people in Cameroon with the results of this expedition. So we got funding from National Geographic, which was pretty exciting. And one of our discoveries was amazing orchids lived in these canopies. But when they log the forest, they pile up the canopy and they burn it to get rid of it. Nobody in those villages had a clue that someone in London was going to pay a thousand pounds for an orchid. So they never connected that these things were worth anything. So we thought if we could educate the villagers and they could create orchid farms, they're very easy to grow. As most of you know, they're air plants. They don't need a lot of cultivation. And we could allow them to create a model and sell these orchids in Nairobi or some other centers. So we got funding, which was really great. We knew what orchids were there because we'd already sampled it and published it. And so we thought now the real challenge is how do you get moms and dads who are fighting malaria, who are going out and lassoing their dinner with a little tiny trap in the forest. How on earth do you convince them to come to a botany class at night in the schoolhouse and look at these really ugly things that usually aren't flowering except every five years? And so here's the value of working with a local. My friend Bernard Kongmanik, the local, he said, we buy beer with the grants and they'll all come to the class. And we did. And they all came, and they all loved it, and they learned their orchids. So it's kind of like, I'm probably blackballed at National Geographic, but so what? Um, we had this amazing experience, and this is what, these are our climbers. They didn't need ropes. They have the most amazing climbing techniques and skills in the world, and this is what an orchid farm looks like. It's really just a little tiny flat surface that you can raise and lower in the canopy because orchids just grow with the drops of water from the rain and all of the particles that come in and give them nutrition. So they're totally easy to maintain, but you have to teach someone this plant is really valuable. And if you've never been to a market in London or Nairobi, you would never understand that people pay money for these things. So there's a lot of sustainable products in the forest that people down there can learn to manage if we help them with this kind of knowledge. And there's one of the beautiful, beautiful products that comes away. Um, next to last example is how about touching students' lives? And I mentioned that before. I think this is my biggest passion in the world, maybe because I'm a mom. But I was really, really lucky to work with Bob Ballard for about 15 years. We did a huge distance learning project in the 90s and early 2000s, kind of before it was really popular. but. What we did was we would go to the Amazon, for example. We rigged amazing miles of lines, electric lines, right up into the canopy. And I would go up there with middle school kids, and we would broadcast back to the US, Australia, and Europe. And then on opposing years, Bob would do his marine thing and other ecosystems. So we picked the canopy and the undersea, not surprisingly, because in a way, they're kind of really cool exploration places for kids. And when we did that, we would also take a couple 24 or so middle school students and teachers with us. So at the end of the day, I actually had a research team. I had these abilities to broadcast back to kids all over the world. And through this kind of business of way back at the beginning, meshing virtual technology and real nature, we were able to touch a lot of kids' lives. And I continue to get emails from students who say, I remember in seventh grade I saw you, and now I'm a biology major at Harvard. And I'm like, holy cow. You know, it's really, really scary, I think, how important it is to touch kids in middle school and high school. Because probably even before they come to college, it's really important. And maybe that's what happened to Roy Chapman Andrews. Maybe he really climbed a tree and got excited when he was growing up here. I, I think he did. I'm going to believe that, even though I know his historian is still working on that story. And there I am, going up and down the trees with all these wires, 
we did have one near electrocution, but never mind. We all managed to survive. We had to put on a like a show that was an old one and make people think it was live when it wasn't. We were all lying prostrate up in the canopy thinking that we were about to be struck by lightning, but never mind. Um, so my last example today is probably my most urgent. It's a project I'm working on now where I really need to think outside of the box. I need your help because I'm not finished yet, but it's Ethiopia. And of course, Ethiopia is in this extremely dry part of Africa. A lot of that's due to our practices, our carbon dioxide affecting the atmosphere, and ultimately we are causing some places to have more extreme environments, including Africa. In this case, this is Saturday going to Walmart in Ethiopia. There is no Walmart, of course, they're going to the market, but for the most part, women have bare feet. They carry these yellow plastic tubs to get water and they rely on a forest patch where the water spring, the freshwater spring exists. And you know, when you end up with this extremely dry area, you don't get water and you're still walking 50 miles to market to get the food that's going to feed your family. So it's a pretty extraordinarily tough environment at the best of times. And the even scarier thing is here's a Google Earth image. Here are the forests in northern Ethiopia. This little dot, this little dot. I'm really sorry that back projector doesn't give you a lot of color, um, but you can barely see there's about three or four little tiny green dots in what is otherwise really, really um, agricultural, subsistence agricultural practices, dry fields that are struggling to grow a little bit of wheat or teff or corn, and so not surprisingly, they've reduced all their forests to these little tiny patches. And here's the really good news. These remaining patches of forests have in the center a church. This is the Orthodox Christian religion. These forests are over a thousand years old for the most part because the priests believe that they are the stewards of all of God's creatures. So they love these forests and the people love the forests, but they don't have a Google Earth image. They can't afford a fence. And so places where the farmer has plowed a little too aggressively are being degraded. All the cattle and goats get in and eat the seedlings. And then the kids see the trees looking a little bit tired or sick or unhealthy from all the nibbling. And they go and pull them down for firewood. And so over time, we've predicted probably in the next 10 years, this last 5% of forests will disappear. Just as a relation, here's my church in Florida. I got an aerial image. What surrounds my church in Florida? Parking lot, that's right. So that's the good news. The Ethiopians have the ethic of nature. They just need a little help implementing it. I tried to get my minister, and I really do like her a lot, to put more forest around our church. And guess what? We got a bigger parking lot. So. There at least the ethic is at hand for these Ethiopians. Um, so how to do this? Um, here we go again, 149 men and one woman. But this is a workshop that I've been hosting every year for the priests. And I only can do this project successfully because I have a colleague who is local, who happens to be about the only forest conservation biologist in northern Ethiopia. And he is really so worried because he doesn't know how to save the forest, but together the two of us can make a really good team where I bring in some of the resources and he has the local relationships. And so we've gone from them going, oh my gosh, what is this woman doing here? To now I have an MOU, it's this piece of paper called a Memorandum of Understanding. I'm the only white person that has an MOU with the Coptic Church in Ethiopia to come into their forest because they trust me now and help them save their biodiversity. And the reason is that they have now learned from these workshops what a forest means. Most of the priests never went out of their forest property their whole adult life. They didn't know that 95% of Ethiopia had lost its forests. They didn't know that all the pollinators of their crops spend their lifestyle, part of their life cycle in the forest. They didn't know that freshwater springs are only found in the forest or that all the medicinal trees are in the forest. So without that knowledge, they couldn't become real conservation biologists. But now we've 
surveyed their biodiversity, and further, we've taught them about the value of what they have, so they're so excited. And here's the really frustrating part still for me. These kids have no books, they have no pencils, they have no computers, and so how do we teach them natural history? How do we, they have no Thoreau or, you know, any kind of heroes in their life with science, so it's really amazing. Sometimes by the end of a day, I have 200 kids following me. They are so excited to see a beetle or an ant, but nobody's ever pointed this out to them before. So part of our strategy here has to be educating the next generation. They have become the best helpers in the world, but if we give them a checklist, it'll go in mom's cook stove. If we give them a book, there's not even any place to put it. If we, we have to give them all the school supplies if they're gonna start making lists, but they're so eager, they're so excited. And so one of two things that we've come up with so far, and I know there could be more ideas. One is the priests on their own surprised me three years ago with a wall. They took the stones out of the field, which helped the harvest, and they built the wall because it kept the cattle out, and it also made a boundary so they have some extra area to plant new trees. So that's a really exciting project. So now I've been fundraising, not writing technical papers, mind you, to help pay locals to build these cute little walls, and everybody wants a wall. The culture of the whole countryside in northern Ethiopia has gone from not understanding why their forests are valuable to everybody wanting a wall. So that's really important is what we call bottom-up conservation, meaning the locals are invested. It's not some decision coming from a high up government leader, it's all the people wanting this change, which is really important. Um, so the other thing that we've done is, um, this is kind of weird, but to give the kids a field guide, we made t-shirts with Amharic, which is the native language, and we put all the important insects on the shirt, because most of the kids there wear to school every day a blanket. That's the blanket they sleep in, but they don't have a shirt, they don't have other clothing, so they wear the blanket that they sleep in. And so for them to get a t-shirt is not only awesome and cool, but in this case, the t-shirt is their field guide. So we're experimenting with this. The one problem we had in year one is all the priests wanted a t-shirt too. So then we brought back extra large and all the priests immediately pulled all their white stuff off. I almost was closing my eyes, it's like obscene. And they put the shirt on and then they put all their white robes back on again. So interesting, interesting, but now we know we have to bring the priests a t-shirt and then we can give the kids a t-shirt. But I'm fishing for ideas still. You know, there are six billion people out there who don't live like us and they need conservation, but they don't need the same things we have because they can't use them. So we all have to put our heads together. I think Beloit students can do this and I know you will. So I'm excited about that. So in closing, I just want to say that I think Science is such a huge part of solutions. If you become an economist, a politician, hopefully you've had some science background that allows you to think about problem solving. I think every kid needs some element of nature. All of us need that and we can use it in combination with all these cool virtual tools. Um, I'd love to think of every kid climbing a tree, including those who might have disabilities because I think it's possible and it's really an inspiring hook to think about bigger issues in the world than maybe just your own life and what it's all about. Um, here is, by the way, my team from last summer. Here's my star student, Rebecca, who dreamed all her life of climbing, and now she's doing it, and now she's publishing a paper about new water bears, and she's even coming to the Amazon with me next summer, and we're gonna figure out how to get her 125 feet up into this canopy where I work down there, which is really, really thrilling. So um, I think we owe it to our kids, all of us. Um, that's my story. I'm really honored to be walking in the footsteps of amazing people on the list for this award. And I just want to say in closing that I'd love you all to come and visit me at the California Academy. We're adopting this message of sustainability for all of our scientific research. I would love ideas from all of you about how to help Ethiopia and other places. And this is the last two sentences of my book that I think is available after the talk. I just wanna share with you my kind of motherly philosophy that I've learned from all of my science. And what it says is that one of the most meaningful insights I have acquired 
along my life's journey is that it takes the same amount of energy to complain as it does to exclaim, but the results are incredibly different. Learning to exclaim instead of to complain has been my most valuable lesson. Thank you. has agreed to answer some questions and after a few questions she's going to go out into the lobby and uh, sign some books. Does anybody have a question for her? Yes, in the back. The water bears, they have a snout, which makes them look like a little bear, but they don't send darts or do anything nasty. Believe it or not, they're kind of friendly. You could have one for a pet, but it's, you'd have to watch it under a microscope. <laughs> Maybe your mom would like that. You don't have to feed it too much. <laughs> okay, any other questions, class? <laughs> A couple of hands oh, back right. there. Right. Almost always we try to use native timber. That was a huge challenge in Samoa, for example. For We tried for a long time to bring timber from Australia or New Zealand, and no ships would even cart it for us without a guarantee of it. You know, in most cases, poles break and things happen on ships. So that's what we usually do in the States. Um, there's a lot more construction uh, regulations, so we have to build it out of pressure treated this or that. But in the tropics, there are so many hardwoods, and the locals know which ones to harvest, and they've always carefully harvested different woods for their canoes and things. So it's really easy to build those very carefully. Do I? Oh, yeah, actually. That picture of all those little critters that I showed, the, in the middle was a beautiful mite named after me. Isn't that charming? <laughs> but I kind of love it, because it's Ethiopian, and that makes me happy. Sort of the underdog philosophy. It's not, no sexy butterflies yet or anything. <laughs> yes? How many countries have I been to? What a great question. I've got to count that up. But I think maybe 15 to 20, quite a lot. So I promise you, I'm going to look at, there's a map at the front of my book, so if you come up afterward, we can look at it, okay? Gosh, put me on the spot with a hard question. <laughs> oh, Ethiopia is more uh, montane, tropical forest, okay? Because it's very, it's highlands for the most part. So it's not lowland jungle like Cameroon, and that's a big difference, of course. More, there's a dry season and a wet season for most of that area. The northern part was about 50% forest originally, now it's less than five. The southern part, of course, is where a lot of the coffee is coming from, and that's still about 30% forested or so, but it's all agroforestry type of, uh, it's much different from its original composition. Yes? Oh, that's a nice question. How old? My sons are 26 and 28. They can carry mom's bags. I call them for all sorts of advice, which is really great. And one majored in chemistry, and now he's doing uh, clean energy in Arizona. And the other majored in applied math. I never knew math was so handy. He, he graduated the year that Wall Street collapsed, and all his finance friends didn't get jobs. He had five job offers because he knew how to model environmental, like he was modeling nitrogen cycles in forests or something, and he didn't get a job for that, but he got a job modeling, you know, with companies and things. I was just really impressed, and 
now he's actually in the environmental health world. He has a startup company to do fecal transplants. My son is a poop expert, but <laughs> it's very life-saving, so I'm watching him with awe. <laughs> yes? Yes, the whole tower construction crane thing intrigues me a lot. I kind of have a joke that, you know, when an American construction company gets an old crane that's rusty and probably doesn't pass OSHA standards, they give it to biologists, because I'm not really sure what you do with an old crane. Um, they've, they're having a little bit of setback because they're very expensive to operate. You usually have to get a union driver. It's not easy to get a union crane operator in Venezuela or Panama or some of these places. And so that's provided a lot of hindrance because scientists don't usually have enough in their budget to hire a crane driver. So it's causing some hiccups in what is otherwise looks like a very cool access opportunity. But it, you know, it's almost like we need our own union of retired crane drivers that would go along with retired construction cranes <laughs> and help operate them. So stay tuned if we can make that one a little more successful. It definitely is not affordable in India or Africa at this point. Yes. Um, most of the biodiversity is two-thirds up. In actual fact, the top is quite an extreme environment. It's windy, it's hot, it gets dried out quicker than the rest, so it, we need to go there. It's very important for flowers and fruits, for example, but it's also very extreme. So ideally, we need to spend a lot more time in the top quarter of the trees, which is a little hard to do because usually it's above where the strong branches are but it's below where the balloon can reach and it's harder out of reach of the crane arm in a lot of cases. So that's kind of the sweet spot for getting to all the biodiversity. So we can dangle with ropes, which is one thing. We can build little towers, which is another. So we're still looking at things. The crazy thing about the canopy is it's still a needle in a haystack. We need a lot more people and information to really survey well what's up there. It's kind of crazy, but there's not a lot of sophisticated tools for canopy research at this point in time. Yes? Right, and that's called fogging, and I actually am one of them. I did that in Australia, which was the first time we did thorough biodiversity surveys there. Fogging is like doing uh, spraying your body with insect spray when you go in the forest, you have a little column where no mosquitoes are around you. In the case of scientists, we fog a column in the forest to get everything to land uh, at the bottom so we can bring them back to a museum for analysis. Two things, one is it is the only way we can get a comprehensive survey, and secondly, we've done enough research to show that most insects are in enough abundance and they recover in these columns within 24 hours. It's not something I could recommend everywhere. It's a little like Audubon used to shoot birds to actually draw them, and a lot of coral reef biologists do. Unfortunately, sometimes they use dynamite to get big arrays of fish to bring back for collections to assess reefs. You know, destructive sampling is not great, so you have to think really long and hard, and usually we can't do that in a national park, which is really good. A lot of times we do it in areas before they're about to be logged or some other management, um, you know, destructive um, follow-up is going on, and that's a good chance to go in and have less guilt about bringing specimens out. But always you've got to think really hard about is it worth it? And w at one point I was on a board where we turned down some projects for that because sci the scientist had built up a large backlog of specimens that he hadn't analyzed. So we have to keep very ethical oversight to any of that kind of research. Yes? Um, great question, a huge problem, and I actually a whole chapter of my life I was a farmer in Australia. We had 
6,000 whole Hereford cattle and 15,000 merino sheep, and that's where my kids were born. So we saw a lot of issues with Mother Nature, and one of the biggest memories I have was this, in the 1980s, a huge forest dieback. We lost almost all of our 10% remaining trees on the farm to insect outbreaks, because we, you know, historically the ancestors had cut back exactly what you just said. And number one, the sheep no longer had shade. Number two, our soil was at risk. And so therefore the whole economy of the country was at risk. So we had this huge project to plant trees back on the farm. And then it was hard to get the seed source for the local trees. So boy, my advice would be those are precious, those windbreaks. And hopefully people will see that and recognize it. Because again, a lot of times you have trees with the seed source that's perfectly adapted for a region. And if you bring seeds of willow or you know hickory in from 200 miles away, they might not be as well adapted to that region as the ones that have been there for hundreds of years. So I would sure advise against that. It doesn't usually make up for itself in terms of numbers of head of cattle or rows of corn, but um, I'd love to know more about that later because I'm surprised, I, I think in these, also, when you have water courses, the, the roots of the trees usually stabilize the water, they prevent flooding, they, they do a lot of good, usually more than damage to have them in terms of the economy of the farm. Yes? Great question, because you know, we cut down almost 95% too. At the turn of the century, a hundred and so years ago, we had cleared this country. I think now there is only 3% real original primary forest in America, and it's very hard to find. We have mostly secondary growth. We're lucky that our economy supported us to replant a lot of areas that were cleared. So most forests that you see are what are called secondary growth. Um, that's great, but what we really don't know is what was the biodiversity in 1850? How many things really lived in our forest? Because nobody had the data. So we almost have to be cautious about complaining about what they're doing in Brazil or you know, the Amazon or the Congo Basin because we came from a place where we lost a lot of biodiversity, presumably. We put our forests at risk, but we were very lucky to have enough industry in this country to support all that replanting. A lot of these countries now are facing extreme climate and no economy that allows them to bring forests back that in these areas where the agriculture is so critical. And we still have issues. One of those, just talking about those farms, but an issue now is America, we on average cut a tree down when it's nine years old. In other words, they've done all these studies about medians and construction in urban areas. A tree lives on average about nine years before someone comes in and renovates a house or builds a wider road. And we're actually selecting for smaller trees. So there's a whole group trying to protect the big trees because their actual DNA, their seeds are, you know, would produce a different tree. It's almost the same with the fisheries now. We're selecting fish are getting smaller because we overfished all the big ones. So we have to be a little more cautious, I think, about how we might be viewing our tree stock if we're not careful. So maybe the book signing yeah, or so please, whatever. Please join me in thanking Dr. Lauman for a very interesting talk. Thank you very Thank much. You. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you for coming to the light. Thank you. Can I take this with me? Sure. Ooh, pretty. So she asked me, may she take this with her? I think that that, that is her gift. She's going to be in back with her books, and if you'd like to have her sign a book or speak with her, she'll be in, in back ready to do that. Thank you very much for coming.